to be starting a series today on the cross of the Savior. It's a book written by a disciple named Mark Templer. He's actually the father of one of our disciples in our church, Maddie Templer. And Mark and his wife Nadine have been missionaries all over the world and are doing amazing things. Mark now works for the State Department. But what I'm excited about is that in a couple weeks on Easter Sunday, I have asked Mark and Nadine to preach and to share at our virtual Easter service, and they've agreed to do that. So that's going to be a, a real special treat to have the author of the book come and preach for us. We're undergoing a social distancing, isolation, quarantine, very different than anything we've, anything we've ever experienced before. And this can produce self-pity, loneliness, all, all kinds of different feelings that arise in our minds. Depending on how you respond to the situation, this could be one of the best times you've ever done, ever had spiritually, or one of the most challenging. If you're going to make a difference in this world, you're going to have to learn how to walk alone. You're going to have to learn how to grapple with times of isolation, loneliness. I want you to think historically about the people that have inspired us from the past. Nearly every one of them went through times when they had to walk the lonely road of conviction all by themselves. Think about the Apostle Paul. He spent years in prison and jail. Nelson Mandela, who brought uh, an end to the apartheid regi regime in South Africa. He spent 27 years in prison on Robben Island. Martin Luther King Jr. spent many, many days, weeks in jail to fight for civil rights in America. Mohandas Gandhi, he spent so many, so many years in jail also. All of these men fighting for freedom, they experienced isolation, quarantine, solitary confinement as the price of bringing change to this world. God is calling us to a higher level. Let's learn how to handle these difficulties with nobility, with courage, so that we can be worthy of the challenges that we're facing. Let's get our eyes on Jesus, because he himself is, of course, the master of all those situations, especially overcoming the challenges of self-pity and loneliness. Let's start by reading Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. After no sleep, a heavy flogging, beatings, insults, being spitten upon, mocked, beaten over the head, forced to walk between trials all over the city, and then at the end, carrying a cross, lugging a cross up a hill. Everyone is watching him as he marches up towards his certain death. And people are crying, they're weeping. And Jesus stops, bloody, sweaty, dehydrated. And he turns to these women who are crying for him and he says, don't cry for me, cry for yourself. Cry for your children. Jesus had the reserves, had the capacity to overcome our natural tendency towards self-pity, to turn it around and say, listen, don't cry for me. How did Jesus do that? I think he understood some things that we need to get a hold of today. Number one, suffering reveals. It reveals who you are in times of trials. Jesus' suffering revealed who he was, the Son of God, through and through. There's no self-pity at all. I mean, wouldn't you be tempted? Everyone's crying for you to go, yeah, it's been a pretty tough day. Yeah, 
It's actually, whoo, thank you. Appreciate it, man. The very least. But he says, don't cry for me. I mean, Jesus must have been so messed up, disfigured beyond human likeness. And he says, don't, don't cry for me. He forgave immediately. He said, listen, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prayed. He prayed during that time. He quoted scripture during his suffering. He evangelized. He converted a guy on, on the cross. I mean, can you imagine that? He cared for others. He took care of his mom, made sure she had a plan for retirement. No defensiveness when they were yelling at him, spitting at him. He was silent when they were saying the nastiest things in the world. He was revealed to be the Son of God. What does suffering reveal in you? What does disruption show about your character? What are you learning over the past couple of weeks about who you are as a person and as a disciple? What are some symptoms of self-pity? Griping, moaning, groaning, complaining, feeling sorry for yourself, looking to others to make you happy. How come you're not making me happy? Looking for the bad in all circumstances rather than seeing the good. Talking endlessly about yourself, about aches and pains. And then being mad at other people, being mad at the church, being mad at the people, being mad at the man for not making you happy and pleasing you. These are all signs of self-pity. Jesus never fell prey to them. What's being revealed during this time? It's a good time to check under the hood and go, whoa, I got a few things to work on. I think for all of us, we, we get some time for some reflection there. Jesus also understood that God is in control. Jesus knew it wasn't people that were crucifying. It wasn't the Sanhedrin. It wasn't these wicked Pharisees that were just getting back at him, that they were the source of the problem. No, remember when he talked to, to Pilate? And Pilate said, don't you realize I have power to crucify? And he said, you wouldn't even have that authority unless it were given to you from above. You see, Jesus know, knew who's in control. It's the Father. The Father was crucifying him. The Father was allowing him to be beaten. The Father was allowing him to be humiliated, tortured. It was the Father. Now that's just mind-blowing when you think about it. But Jesus went into it with his eyes open. He knew that all of this was coming around because the will of the Father. God allows suffering to remake you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. If Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 28, Romans 8, verse 28, let's read. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn from among many brothers and sisters. You need to see that God is behind everything that's happening around the planet. We have to have Christian eyes to look at this world. Otherwise, we, we can just get so messed up with partisan wrangling, just criticisms. Oh, you're not doing this right. The president's not doing this right. The Congress isn't doing this right. It's China's fault. It's U.S. fault. Listen, get beyond all that. Look up. Who's allowing it to happen? It's the Father. And during these times, through tough times, it can work good for those who love him. God can work good through bad things. That's what he did on the cross. One thing we know, God considers you worthy to go through trials. Remember the disciples when they were beaten and flogged? What did they say? They went home rejoicing because they've been counted worthy of suffering, disgrace for the name of Jesus. It may not feel good when God is working in your life, but God is working for the good in your life, even when things are bad in your circumstances. God knows how awesome you are, and he's going to test you. He's going to put you through trials 
but just see what you're made of so that you can be refined and made better. He wants to conform you to the image of his son. He's working through tough times to bring good to you. Take time to see the big picture. God's allowing this to happen. We need to have a biblical worldview. God is totally in control. These trials can be a sign that you're worthy to be, to be tested. And trials reveal your character. What's getting revealed? Good time to check. Point number two, dealing with loneliness. In Matthew chapter 27, in verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's one thing to suffer. It's another thing to suffer alone. That's what compounds the sufferings of Jesus. Not only did he have to suffer on the cross, but he had to go through the emotional pain of desertion by all his friends. All of his friends deserting him, pretending they didn't know who he was, Judas betraying him, all that work just seemingly flushed down the toilet in one night because of, of people's fear. Now, on top of that, when Jesus was on the cross, the Father abandoned his son. Why? Because the Father cannot have anything to do with Son. Jesus took on the sin of the world. He experienced the separation of what it means to be separated from God for the very first time. Before that, Jesus never sinned in his life. And he didn't sin even at that time, but he, he took on the cross all that sin, separating him from his Father. And he felt that anguish, and he quotes Psalm chapter 22 to express that. He became sin. Though the Father turned away, Jesus never turned away from his Father. He cried out to him. Loneliness is part of following in Jesus' footsteps. We need to learn from Jesus, and we also need to learn from other disciples like Paul, who was deserted while being in prison. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul here is... is just about to die. It's probably his last letter written. He's writing it to Timothy to encourage him. But let's learn from how he dealt with loneliness. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. What did Paul do when he was facing desertion, isolation? Well, he one thing he didn't do is just nothing. He didn't just sit there and go, man, you know, I'm just going to think about all my troubles. This is a terrible life. Life stinks. No, he wrestled through it and he found ways to make connections, to make a difference, to allow God to work through him. Number one, he reached out to friends. This letter, 2 Timothy, is a letter. It is a true letter. It's not just the Bible. It's a personal reach out to his friend Timothy. So what can we learn there? We need to reach out, talk, call, pray. FaceTime people. There's so many ways today to stay connected. There's no reason why you can't be connected at least on a daily basis. And that's what we need to do. The Bible says encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. We need that encouragement. Absolutely. And I, I so much appreciate the phone calls that I've received and I know you have as well. What else can you do? Ask for help. Paul told Timothy, he said, hey, Timothy, bring Mark. He's helpful to me in my ministry. One thing I'm really excited about right now is that Dominic Munson, Dom Munson, has moved here from New Jersey. And uh, he's going to be in a little isolation here for a couple weeks, but he's going to be helpful in the ministry to take our church to the next level. We need to ask for help. If you're at home and you're going, man, I need help with this situation, call somebody. There's a lot of people that be willing to help. What else can you do? Read. He told Timothy, he said, listen, Timothy, bring my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, we don't use scrolls today, but that's the same thing as a book. That's the book of that day. 
What was Paul doing? Getting deeper, reading, meditating, developing his relationship with God. Now, Paul is one of the greatest minds of all time. And we got to ask ourselves, how did he get that way? By a habit of continual learning. You know, I'm amazed when I, I see people or talk to people and there's no sense of like, hey, I can really grow during this time. Instead, there's just passive entertainment coming in. And listen, guys, I don't want to knock Netflix. I think it's great. Praise God, we've got it. You know, it's fun. It's entertaining. We can watch movies. That's fine. But listen, if that's all you do, you're missing an incredible opportunity to grow and get deep in your walk with God. Just prayer, Bible study. There's so many things you can do. What book are you reading right now? Aside from the Bible, hope you're finishing up your 90-day challenge. But what, what are you reading spiritually? Maybe it's this new book we're going through. Maybe it's another book, something that'll really call you higher. How about an inspiring biography? There's so many good things that are true, noble, right, and pure. What else can you do? Reflect and write. Paul took this time to reflect deeply. Maybe you're not a writer, but you can still keep a journal. And those things are important and they'll be valuable to you in the future. I want you to think about Martin Luther King Jr. When he was in uh, Birmingham, the Birmingham jail, after a protest there, what did he do? He wrote a letter to white Christians challenging them on their apathy towards creating civil rights for black blacks, in, in particular black Christians. How did he do that? Well, he had the time to reflect and write a very comprehensive letter that was so convicting and challenging, and it's inspiring, and I'd recommend you read it. But this is your time, guys. This is your time to dig deep. I want you to think about Nelson Mandela. He spent 27 years in prison on Robben Island. It's kind of like an Alcatraz in South Africa. He was fighting apartheid, racial, racial segregation there in that country. During the time he was in prison, he learned his captor's language, Afrikaans. It's kind of a form of, of Dutch. And when he came out, because he really put the time into learning, to reading, he was able to unite that country. And now there's no longer apartheid. That country is moving towards racial integration. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. At my first defense, no one came to my support. But everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. We got to remember, Jesus is always standing by our side. Paul knew that. He said, listen, everyone's deserted me, but I'll tell you what, Jesus has never stood, has never left my side. Even when you're all alone, you're not all alone. Because Matthew 28, 20 says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You've got a partner in your isolation. What else can we learn here? Paul struggled with a pain of desertion. People, his friends, people he poured his life into, running away, being ashamed of his imprisonment. Demas, going back to the world. Hey, we're going to lose some people. Unfortunately, that's, that's just what Jesus said. The love of most will grow cold. And I don't want to but it, it's gonna happen. We gotta fight against it. We gotta really reach out to our brothers. But don't cop an attitude if you don't get a phone call from somebody or if you, your birthday doesn't get remembered by somebody or you don't get the text you want. Listen, some of us, we sit there and stew because we're not getting the attention that we desire and no one else is struggling with it, only you. Paul said, may the Lord not hold it against them. He's being like Jesus. He said, I'm not gonna allow bitterness to affect me during this time. Keep preaching the word. He shares here, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. He had a conviction that said, I'm gonna preach the word in season and out of season, in jail and out of jail. We have to have that same conviction, brothers and sisters. It says, listen, I preach the gospel no matter what, coronavirus or not. I appreciate the examples of Amanda Valdez. She was helping me with some video editing. We got started talking and I said, how are you doing? She goes, I'm so excited about my studies with, with so-and-so. We're doing online studies and the person's super open. And I just was so convicted, so inspired by this young woman. 
who's got the passion to fully proclaim the gospel. I think about Ramon Jordan. He's a captain in the Air Force. He's still having virtual Bible studies after work. I think about Greta Rodriguez. Greta is a longtime disciple. She reached out and started a study with a, a woman in her 20s from Japan named Yumiko. Guess what? She baptized her last Saturday. Isn't that amazing? That's conviction that says, listen, nothing's going to stop me. No virus, no imprisonment, nothing will keep the gospel chained. I think about Denise Di Dicochea reaching out to her, her relative and studying the Bible with her. And Kathy Mosqueda jumping in there and Jackie Regatta piling on. They're doing it. They're fired up about preaching the gospel. I, I Again, I want to lift up Nate and Dalton down at Sierra Vista at Fort Huachuca. They're locked down. They're basically, you're not leaving this compound. But they're preaching the, the Bible to one of their friends on the base. And we're going to do a Bible study after church today, which is exciting. Listen, you might be dealing with loneliness. You are. I'm sure you're, you're dealing with some effects of this isolation, this disruption to our personal lives. You might be facing some different challenges. Just getting used to the new world that we're living in right now. But don't fall prey to self-pity. Let's rise above. Let's dig deep as disciples. Let's follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. He never gave in to self-pity. Let's gratefully view this as God's means, His method to call us to be stronger and deeper in our walk with Him. And let's reach out in love to friends and to God who never leaves our side. Let's be strong during this time. Thank you.